Amen. All right. So here in Deuteronomy chapter number 28, we really have the most detailed account and detailed record of God's judgments. So what is being discussed here is uh, God is, of course, speaking to the nation of Israel, and he's talking about the different blessings and cursings. And he goes on in Deuteronomy chapter number 28 with a big, long list of different cursings, or you could also refer to them as the different judgments of God. And one point that I want to make early on here uh, to try to make sure that everybody has their, their mind right, they have the right perspective and the right focus on the judgments of God because oftentimes uh, you know, we can, we can uh, you know, emphasize certain judgments or certain things in the Bible a little bit more than others and we can lose perspective of, of God's personality and, and things along those lines. Oftentimes when we think of the judgment of God, of God's judgments, we think of things supernatural like Sodom and Gomorrah. Or we think of things supernatural like the wrath of God that's poured out in the book of Revelation in the end times. We think of things supernatural like the plagues. Many of the plagues that, that uh, uh, you know, smote Egypt and Pharaoh were supernatural. In, in, a, in a mass way, they were supernatural. But there are other types of judgments that God brings upon, you know, men and God brings upon Nations, And this morning I'm going to be preaching about the subject of diseases that are sent from God. Diseases that are sent from the Lord. Now I'm going to get more particular here in just a few minutes. But as I said, here we have God speaking to the children of Israel. And he's, he's speaking about his different judgments that he's going to pour out upon them if they do not obey his word. If they are disobedient, this is what I'm going to do to you. Now the majority of the judgments are a particular type of a judgment. And what they are, they are sicknesses. The majority of the judgments of the Lord here are diseases. The majority are what would also be called pestilences. Those are the majority of God's judgment. If we were to, you know, if we were to actually study God's judgments here, we would come out and, and, and with an understanding that God, by and large, when He chooses to judge someone or to punish someone, His often go-to method is sickness. His often go-to method is a disease that he will stricken someone with or some sort of pestilence that he will stricken you know, a nation or a, or a person with. You know, pestilence in the Bible, let's, I want to define that for you quickly, but pestilence in the Bible is more of a general word. Pestilence can be referring to pests as in locusts and things along those lines, but oftentimes also it's referring to like a parasite, which would also go hand in hand with a disease or some type of worm or something along those lines, a sickness that people are stricken with. I want to look at some of this. I want to home in here starting with verse number 16 here in Deuteronomy chapter number 28. Look with me at verse number 16. The Bible says this, Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing. So right there he was just being generic. He's like, hey, I'm going to curse you. Everything's going to be cursed. That's his point. Now I want you to look at what the curses are. He says, vexation and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do until thou be destroyed and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings whereby thou hast forsaken me. Now he gets specific in verse 21. What are going to be the curses? What is he going to do exactly? The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he have consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. So right there we see something you know, referring to a disease or referring to a type of, a, of a, uh, 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 an inf uh, infestation. Look at verse 22. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption. Again, that's a type of sickness or disease. And with a fever. Of course, that's a symptom of a sickness. And with an inflammation. Again, this is a type of a symptom of, uh, of, a, of a, a disease or a sickness. And with an extreme burning. And with the sword. And then he says, and with blasting and with mildew. And they shall pursue thee until thou perish. Now the majority, the vast majority, 75% of the things that were mentioned there in those few verses, when God starts to become very specific about how he's going to punish the nation of Israel, is he mentions diseases, he mentions pestilences, and he goes through different types of symptoms that people will have. Inflammation, right? 
uh, the fever, the consumption, just all of these different things. And consumption is talking about something, you know, spreading. That's what that means. It's spreading. I want, want you to also, in Deuteronomy 28, skip to verse 27 now. Look with me at verse 27. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt. That is, again, a type of disease. With, and with emeralds and with scab and with the itch whereof thou canst not be healed. So notice there, he goes through a different, a, a different list of, of different types of pestilences or diseases or sicknesses that he is going to smite them with. He says, the botch of Egypt. And then he says, and with emeralds and with the scab and with the itch. A lot of these are symptoms of some sort of disease. It could be some sort of uh, you know, skin disorder or a skin disease. These are just the symptoms that are being mentioned. Skip down to verse 35. Once you see how prevalent this is, that this is God's method of judgment very often. The Lord shall smite thee in the knees and in the legs with a sore botch that cannot be healed from the sole of thy foot unto the top of thy head. Look at verse 59. Verse number 59. Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sickness and of long continuance. Now, if you're paying attention when we were reading Deuteronomy 28, we just hit the conclusion of all the lists of everything that he is going to do to Israel, that he's going to bring upon Israel if they choose to forsake the Lord God. And verse 59 is him, as I said, concluding or summarizing all the different plagues. And notice what he says. He says, wonderful. He says, the plagues, great plagues. And then he says, sore sicknesses. Now look at verse 60. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt which thou wast afraid of and they shall cleave unto thee. So notice how he said, hey, all those diseases and all those sicknesses that I just said that I'm going to curse you with. So notice what he summarizes his judgments as. Plagues, sicknesses, diseases, right? And then he says this, moreover, also, not only those diseases and those plagues, but I'll bring upon you all of the diseases and the plagues and the sicknesses that I smote Egypt with, the ones that you were afraid of. He says, and they shall cleave unto you. Then he says in verse 61, also every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. So notice again in verse 61, what is God summarizing all of his judgments as? What is God concluding every judgment, basically, that he promised that he would bring upon Israel as if they were to disobey him? diseases, sicknesses, plagues, different types of health disorders that he's going to curse them with. They are diseases. Now, if we look at the judgment of God and if we just as Christians think about, hey, what is the judgment of God going to be in my life? Oftentimes, we don't think about it being as a disease or a sickness. Oftentimes, we think about just like uh, basically the, the end or the conclusion of all as being death. Oftentimes we think about maybe us losing money or losing wealth. And hey, God does punish people with those types of things. But I want you to realize and understand this morning that God's go-to method when it comes to bringing judgment upon someone is disease. It is sickness. It is pestilence. It is, it is different types of health disorders being stricken with a sickness. I want you to go with me now. You can turn to Deuteronomy 29, 22. So notice there, as I read in Deuteronomy 28, 60. So as I said, you go to Deuteronomy 29, 22. I'm going to read to you again. Deuteronomy 28, 60. It says this. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou wast afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Exodus 15, 26 says this. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. So the, the one judgment, or the, I'm sorry, the one uh, warning that God gives to the children of Israel of a judgment here, he says, hey, 
if you obey me, then I won't put any of the diseases upon you. So what is the go-to? What, what is God actually warning them that if you disobey me, if you turn away from me, what does God say that he is going to curse them with? What is his judgment? He just says disease. So if you had to say, hey, God in the Old Testament when he punished Israel, what did he punish them with? Well, God summarized it as disease. The primary you know, uh, uh, judgment that God would pour out was disease. The go-to method of God's judgment was disease or sicknesses. Deuteronomy 7.15 says this, And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest upon thee, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. And that again was conditioned upon if they were going to obey the Lord. If they were going to disobey the Lord, then God was going to stricken them with disease. He was going to stricken them with sickness. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 22. So that the generation to come of your children that shall rise up after you and the stranger that shall come from a far land shall say when they see the plagues of that land and the sicknesses which the Lord hath laid upon it. So there, I want you to notice that when people are going to come, what are they going to notice? They're going to notice the judgment of God. And what is the judgment of God? It's sicknesses. It's plagues that God has stricken the nation of Israel with. Now I want you to go to Numbers chapter number 11. I just want to now look at what are some of the diseases that God stricken or smote the nation of Israel with during the time while they were in the wilderness. So of course, what we just read about was basically right when they were led out of Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai pretty quickly. And when they were at Mount Sinai, that's when they received the law of God. That's when God gave them these warnings. Now let's look at what were the majority of judgments that God poured out upon the nation of Israel. Numbers chapter number 11 verse number 33 is what I want to look at first. It says this, and, the, and while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people. And the Lord smote the people with a very great plague. I want you to turn to Numbers chapter number 16. Numbers chapter number 16. Now what is it referring to when it says a plague? It's referring to a disease. It's referring to some sort of infectious disease. Some sort of like what we think of, you know, the bubonic plague, right? Or the bubonic plague. You know, what do we think of? We think of some sort of dis uh, uh, disease or a sickness. Some sort of medical condition. We think of like the scab, the itch, the botch, those types of things. Look at now Numbers chapter 16 verse 45. Over and over again when the children of Israel disobeyed God, God punished them with a plague or with a disease, with a sickness. Verse number 45, the Bible says this, Get you up from among this congregation that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them. Watch this. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. So notice he says, I'm going to consume them. And how does he choose to consume them? A lot of times we think of fire. We think of God's judgment. We think of God's wrath. Oh, he's just going to pour out fire from heaven. There's going to be, you know, he's going to open up the earth and it's going to swallow them. Yeah, these are you know, types of judgments that God uses, but it's not the majority of God's judgment. It's not the majority of God's judgments. Most of the time when God judges the nation of Israel, it's with a plague. It's with a disease. It's with a sickness. Keep reading. It says this in verse number 48. Uh, it says, And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague were, four, were 14,700 beside them that died about the matter of Korah. And uh, Aaron returned unto Moses under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. Go to Numbers chapter number 25. Numbers chapter number 25. Look at verse number 7. It says, And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of 
Israel. And those that died in the plague were 20 and 4,000. So notice again, God smites the nation of Israel. What does he choose to do? He sends out a, a disease. He sends out a pestilence or he sends out some sort of contagious you know, medical disorder. Now I want you to turn with me now. We're going to go to... Uh, go to Go to 2 Chronicles 26, 19. Look at other things that God, different diseases and, and disorders that God has smitten people with. Uh, Isaiah chapter 38, verse number 12 says this, Mine age is departed and is removed from me as a shepherd's tent. I have cut off like a weaver my life. He will cut me off with pining sickness. That's like a degrading, a slowly degrading sickness. From day even to, to night wilt thou make an end of me. So when he's praying here, I want you to notice when this, this, this uh, it's Isaiah, of course, he's praying to the Lord. And what is he assuming of how he's going to be smitten by God? Well, he knows the, the character of God. He's a prophet of God. And what does he assume is going to be his end? How does he assume that God is going to punish him? He says he thinks that he's going to punish him with a pining sickness. This is a degrading sickness. Pining means it's something that's slowly just deteriorating. That's what that means to pine or pining. It means a pining sickness. It's just going to eat away at you. Do you know what it means? It means something that consumes you or a consumption. That's what it means. That's how he assumed that God was going to punish him because this is God's go-to punishment. This is God's go-to judgment. So you should have turned to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter number 26. Let me get there myself. 2 Chronicles chapter number 26. We're going to look at verse number 19. It says this, Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. Now watch this. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his, in his, I'm sorry, in his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. So Uzziah here was, of course, disobeying the Lord. He went into the temple. And he's getting ready to offer a sacrifice, all of these things. He had been warned and God ends up smiting him. God ends up, you know, strickening him with a judgment. And you know what it was? It was leprosy. Leprosy, which is discussed many times in the Old Testament, can be used by God as a judgment. He'll send out leprosy to people. I want you to go now to uh, go to go to the New Testament. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 27 says, The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Well, so what God would do would he would smite people with the disease of leprosy. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. A lot of people don't know this, but lepr leprosy still exists today. And it's primarily uh, uh, located in the region of India. It's toward you know, the Mediterranean area and people even in the Mediterranean region uh, still you know, will contract leprosy. And it is, it is basically, you know, an immunity issue. And if you break out with, as the Bible describes it, with just huge scabs and sores all throughout your body, rashes throughout your body, and it's an immunity issue. It's kind of like how, what cancer does. You know, cancer just eats away at your body. It's a disease inside your body that is consuming you where it is eating away all of the good of your body. It's, it's cells that are attacking itself. That's what leprosy does. It's a pining sickness. It's a consuming sickness that is slowly eating the person's body, eating the person's immunity, and uh, causing them to, and it lowers their immunity and causes them to become sick easily as well. And then they'll catch another sickness or another uh, disease and die of it. A lot of times that's what happens with people when they get cancer. They get cancer, now their immunity and their immune system has been, you know, questioned. It's much weaker. And then they will catch maybe pneumonia and die of pneumonia because they're not able. And, and even chemo does, you know, even more so of that. Uh, you'll hear about that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 30. So uh, this is not only Old Testament. This is New Testament as well. You know, people sometimes, they always do this. And I mentioned this recently where they think like there's two different gods. You know, the God of the Old Testament or the God of the New Testament. Or like God, you know, got on some medication in the New Testament and now he's cooled down or something. He needed something to calm him down. You know, the God of mercy of the New Testament was just as merciful in the Old Testament. The God of wrath of the Old Testament that people want to view as being just this wrathful, vengeful God, 
He also is wrathful and he also is vengeful in the New Testament. It's the same God. The God of mercy and of wrath is the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, both. He's balanced. It's one God. It's not, you know, oh, it's the Father in the Old Testament just destroying everyone and then the Son came and, you know, he brought grace. That's not how it works at all. That's not a New Testament teaching at all. You know, the punishments and the wrath that's poured out in the end times in the book of Revelation, which is the very last book, is by far the most extreme wrath that's poured out in the entire Bible. So the very last book, the very last chapters, are more vengeful and wrathful than the entire Bible, I'd say. So there's only one God, and it's the same God of the Old and New Testament. When he punished people in the Old Testament and the you know, Christians in the Old Testament, he punished... Yo, uh, uh, I'm sorry, he, yeah, the Christians that he punished in the Old Testament, he punishes Christians the same way in the New Testament. There is no difference. So if God would smite his children, if God would smite the children of God or, or all these different, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, the nation of God, if you will, all these different Israelites with sicknesses in the Old Testament, do you know what he'll do in the New Testament? He'll smite Christians with sickness as well if he's judging them. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the Lord. So notice he's talking about the judgments of God. And what does he mention? I want you to notice this. He says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. So sleep is talking about that they are dead. But he begins with them being weak and with them being sickly. Now why would you be weak? What would cause you to be weak? Of course because you are sick, right? Oftentimes the Bible repeats itself. When it's referring to someone being weak, obviously the reason why someone would be weak in the first place is because they are sick. It could be referring to, uh, uh, in general, other types of weakness. People you know, get hurt and maybe they have some sort of physical injury. God could do that to you as well. But then it says this, and many sleep. When people die, what do they normally die of? Oftentimes. Very often, you know, uh, people will die of a sickness, right? The, you know, most people, when they end up dying, they die from some sort of sickness, whatever it may be. Even when people say, hey, they died of old age. Yeah, they, they, they lived out a long life and they were pretty healthy when they died, but normally they get to the point where their immune system is very low and they catch a cold or something and that's what causes them to pass away. That's oftentimes. So this, if we look at even the New Testament summarization of punishments and judgments to a Christian from God, what is the majority of it referring to? Sickness. It's referring to God causing you to be weak. It's referring to God, you know, uh, 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 killing you. And, you know, the way that I read that is, many are weak and sickly among you, and then it says, and many sleep. What do you think them dying was the result as, if we just look at that passage? What makes the most sense? Probably a sickness. Why are they weak? Because they're sick. What was God's judgments in the Old Testament? The majority of His judgments, how does He summarize His judgments? How does He judge people most of the time when we read about the punishments that He gives to Christians? Sicknesses, diseases, pestilences. That's how God would judge people. So if we were to see a judgment from God today, do you know how God's probably going to judge you if you're disobedient to Him? Most likely it's not going to be you losing your money. and He could do that, yeah. But you know how God's character is? If we study out the Bible, we get to know God. You know what's more likely? God's going to cause you to become sick. God's going to give you some sort of disorder, a medical disorder, an inflammation, a fever, a consumption. God's going to give you a botch. He's going to give you some sort of you know, uh, 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 itch or scab or rash that could spread throughout your body. Do you know why? Because it's meant to put you into misery. That's why. You know, when people just die in a car accident, obviously the judgment's just over. But, but you know what's much, much worse? Is when you've got to go through day in and day out a life of sickness. There's not much worse than just living a life of just... I mean, how bad is it when you get a bad sickness even, like a fever or something? Like the flu. I mean, if you look at some of the most miserable times of your life, when would you say that they were? Probably when you're laying in bed sick. If you look at people that have serious diseases that are smitten with bad, bad diseases in their life, and obviously all diseases aren't you know, judgments of God. It's just people that just have bad diseases and they have to live with this the rest of their life. See how miserable these people are? Many times you hear people say, I'd rather die than have to go through this. 
And that's the purpose of the judgment. It's meant to bring misery. It's meant to bring unhappiness. It's meant to punish you and for you it to be unpleasant. It's meant to make your life, you know, just, you know, uh, uh, as I said, unpleasant or filled with misery. That's the purpose of it. So, God will, God will punish Christians in the New Testament with sickness. That is God's go-to punishment. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 15, And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. You know why that child died? God didn't just snap his fingers and kill the baby. God gave it a sickness. And then days went by and then the child ended up dying from a, uh, from a disease or from some sort of sickness, some sort of cold, some sort of virus, whatever it may have been. And that's why the child died. Now, of course, that was a result of or a punishment to David because of his sin. Because that child was the offspring of his adulterous relationship uh, that was conceived with Bathsheba. And that was his punishment. How did God choose to punish David? A sickness? When David numbers the people, how does God punish them? The choice of the Lord. Remember, hey, I'm going to send the man. Man will do these things. This will be this. But when God's going to bring a punishment directly, because remember, God, David said, I'd rather fall into the hands of the Lord. So that was God's punishment directly. What was it? It was a plague that he was going to send throughout the people. Over and over and over again, you know, what God does is he sends a pestilence. He sends a sickness. He sends a disease. Go to Acts chapter number 12. Now, you know, uh, those are all examples of uh, while you're in the New Testament, we'll look at Acts 12. Those are all examples of God punishing Christians, right? God punishing His people, what we were looking at there. We would see, you know, the Lord punishing Israel. We see Christians mentioned in 1 Corinthians 11. We saw Israel again being punished, the children of God in the wilderness. <coughs> we saw David being punished, right? And sometimes people get the wrong idea and they'll misunderstand when the Bible talks about uh, God chastening His sons only. And if you are without chastisement whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. And they'll take that to the, to the, to the point of uh, that God never punishes anyone other than His children while on this earth. And that is not true. That's not true at all. And I, there are specific specific exceptions to this. And this is important if you pay close attention. This is a very important uh, 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 lesson in, from the Bible that I'm about to explain to you. By and large, ge generally and generically, that statement that I just made was true. That God does, almost all of the time, just punish Christians. But there are exceptions, and these exceptions are very specific, and they're very consistent throughout the Bible. When God you know, will end up punishing a heathen or a man that is not saved, a man that is not of the Lord, it's in these types of situations. Almost every time, and this is like 99% of the time, it is a man who is persecuting the children of God. And I mean, this is almost every single example that you can think of. Now, if we go through some of those, we have Pharaoh, we have Haman, God brought, of course, is very clear that he brought the punishment upon it. We have, of course, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And that's why they ended up, Babylon ended up being destroyed ultimately in the end as well. It's, it's, it's all, almost every time, and you can go through these, you can go through a list in your own mind, try to think of all the different people that were heathen men that were punished throughout the Bible. Almost every single example. Almost the only time when God will punish a heathen man, a man that is not a child of God and he does punish them while on this earth and stricken them with a disease or something along those lines, it's because they are, Sennacherib is another example, it's because they are oppressing the children of God. Oppressing Israel in the Old Testament or persecuting Christians. I'll give you another perfect example. Herod. Look at Acts chapter 12 verse 23. <clears throat> And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now this is talking about King Herod, right? And it says that God smote him and it says and he was eaten of worms. Now this is, I'm sure you say, well, what do you mean eaten of worms? It's a disease. Do you know what it's called? Well, we call it intestinal worms. He was eaten up from the inside is what happened here. God smote him with a disorder, a pestilence. That is an example of a pestilence. But we would also refer to this as a disease. It's a parasite. 
It's an internal worm or an intestinal worm that God you know, smote him with, and then, you know what the worms do is they're a parasite. They eat off of whatever is inside of your body. So they'll eat your food, and they'll live inside your guts. They'll eat your food, and then you know what they'll do? It'll go further than that, and then they'll start eating you to the point where they, they, they poke all of these different holes into your colon, and they're just eating your guts, basically, until you die of this disease, until you bleed to death, all these internal wounds. It's a very, very, you know, uh, 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 miserable death. It's a very, ve it's, a, it's a strong vexation as God refers to it as. But why did God smite, you know, uh, Herod? Of course it says because he gave not God the glory, but what do we know about Herod? What are the things about Herod? What was Herod well, well known for? He killed John the Baptist, didn't he? But also, I want you to look at verse 1. Notice this. In the very beginning of that chapter, it says this. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So notice what Herod was known for. Now he's a heathen man. He was for sure not saved. He was not a child of God. And what did God do to this man? He ended up smiting him and killing him. Now you can go through example after example. And I've actually preached a sermon about this and I've done this and I've studied it out. When God punishes a heathen man, almost every time... It, and I don't know of any exceptions, so I'm kind of giving you know, the, the disclaimer, almost... Almost every time in the Bible, if not every time, the, what the purpose of that punishment is, is because they were persecuting Christians, or they were hurting or harming Christians. They are oppressing the children of God. <clears throat> Go to 1 Samuel chapter number 5. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter number 5. Here is the nation of the Philistines. <clears throat> What we're going to read about here in 1 Samuel chapter number 5. So God smote Herod there, is what we saw, who is an individual man. But not only that, God will punish nations sometimes. And He'll punish them for the purpose of them oppressing the children of God. That's the reason why He would smite them. Now there is the exception of the Canaanites. And the Canaanites were particularly judged by God and by the children of Israel so that they could inherit the, the land of Canaan. That's why that they were, uh, uh, they were judged specific, for that very specific reason. If you look at the heathens, as far as the, the, the country of heathens and, and godless nations, these pagan nations were often judged for their persecution of other nations, for their persecution of the nation of Israel, specifically of nations of God. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 5, verse 6. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem under the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame. I'm in 2 Samuel. You guys are thinking, what are you reading here? An NIV? Go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5 is where we are going to read. Verse number 6 is where I'm going to begin. It says, But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon, the, upon them of Ashdod, this is the Philistines. And he destroyed them, watch this, and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. They sent therefore, they sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about into Gath. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. Look at verse 9. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. And they had emeralds in their secret parts. So notice here that he's, that he's punishing the land of the Philistines. He's punishing the land of the, those of Ashdod. And uh, those that were the Philistines at that time. Now, this is obviously a godless, heathen nation. Now, they took the ark, and that's one of the primary reasons why they're being punished right now as well. But they stole the ark through battle when they defeated the Israelites. And the Philistines are known all throughout the Old Testament of continually, and all throughout the book of Judges, continually oppressing the Israelites. And that's also another example of God judging heathen nations. Why did He judge heathen nations all throughout the book of Judges? In that 400 time period. For their oppression of Israel. And they would cry unto God and then God would punish the heathen nations for the oppression of Israel and for the persecution of the children of God. 
Now, as I said, Philistines is a heathen nation. So we have examples in the Bible of God punishing heathen men also. And he'll punish them with his same go-to method. And what is it? Diseases, pestilences, sicknesses. Over and over and over again, he'll, he'll punish heathen men and heathen kings with this. And why does he do it? For their persecution of Christians. We have examples of God punishing heathen nations, not only just heathen men. Why? And, and how? Well, he punishes the people that are specifically oppressing Israel, oppressing Christians. And how does he do it? What is his method of punishing these people and these nations? It's by disease. Now, what are emirads? That's actually mentioned in Deuteronomy 28 when we read through that list. A lot of people think that it's hemorrhoids because it's a very similar spelling. Emirads, that the word formed from, you know, uh, our, our modern day word hemorrhoids came from emirads. Now, that doesn't mean it's the exact same thing. It could have came from that. But it doesn't mean it's the exact same thing. And that would explain why it's in their secret parts. It's talking about, obviously, in their private parts is what that means. That's how people would word things today, right? In their normally are identifying male and female anatomy. That's what they're talking about. And they were smoten, or smitten with emirates. I've also heard say that it could be like a tumor type thing. The, you know, I'm not exactly sure what it is, but either way... This was something that brought great misery, that brought great affliction, that brought just, just you know, people were, it, was just, it says that they were destroyed. So this is a plague of a disease or a sickness in their secret parts. That's a very sensitive area is the reason why he struck them there. It's a very, it's a, you know, uh, you know people, you know, if, you, if you look at different bodies where, or different, I'm sorry, different parts of your body, that have different degrees or levels of pain, that area, if there is a sickness or a disease or something, it's much more painful in that area. So that's obviously why he did that. So it makes sense that, it's, that it is a type of, of a hemorrhoid or something along those lines. But this was, a, this was a serious type of hemorrhoid, if that's what it was. This was a, a serious plague that God had sent upon them. I want you to go with me now to, I want you to go to the, uh, the New Testament again. Why don't you go to Revelation chapter number 14, verse number 6. Revelation chapter number 14, verse number 6. And, you know, God did the same thing to Israel as well, punishing them uh, with a disease in their secret parts. He says in Isaiah 3, 17, Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. So notice that then, in that case there as well, it's talking about He's smiting them, you know, to where the, to the point of there being, there, there's not a one single, you know, uh, uh, part of their body that has not been stricken with this scab or this disease that they have been given. So in 1 Samuel chapter number 5 we see the persecution of the Philistines and stealing the ark and then them being judged by God. That being a heathen nation. So, to, so to, to teach as many people do that God doesn't judge any heathens, that God doesn't judge any heathen nations or anything like that, that's totally and 100% false. That's not what the Bible teaches. And when God does judge heathen nations, which He's done so many times, do you know how He judges those heathen nations most of the time? With a disease. The same way that He, that he judges personal individuals most of the time. With a sickness, with a pestilence. You know why? Because it brings about great affliction. It, br it brings about great you know, discomfort. It's extremely unpleasant. It's very, you know, uh, uh, it brings about misery. It just puts you in just excruciating pain, great pain. Now, another thing that Baptists are, and I'm, I'm, I'm prefacing something I want to get into here for a few minutes. Another thing that Baptists are guilty for, and I'm guilty for this myself, is oftentimes because we know that, you know, you know, there's no prophets today and we know the prophecy that is next to be fulfilled, we oftentimes think like God doesn't intervene in the world at all today. But that's not true. The same God of the Old Testament, as I said, is the same God of the New Testament. Amen. And God is judging individuals all the time. He's judging Christians daily, on a daily basis for their disobedience and for the different things that they do. And he, and, he, and he works in people's lives and blesses them. God intervenes. Now, God may not be intervening in a supernatural way like He did all throughout you know, the times of the Bible when the Bible was pinned down. and There were many you know, hundreds of years where God wouldn't intervene you know, in those specific supernatural ways. 
But God was still intervening in ways. And God is still intervening today. God hasn't become senile. God's not just tired, you know, of all those hard years of judging nations. God is still the judge of all the earth. Amen. And God still punishes individuals today. And God still punishes nations today. Psalm chapter number 110 verse number 6 says this, He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. So there we kill two birds with one stone. We can see that God judges among the heathen. He judges the earth. This is how God operates and He's still doing so today. There wasn't a time period specifically where He did that. It's just a carte blanche statement. God judges, right? And where will He judge? This is the, the second point from that verse. He'll judge among the nations. He'll judge the heathen nations is specifically what that says. So God still judges heathen nations today. And if we were to look around and see heathen nations, and we were to try to identify a nation that might be judged by God or being judged by God, what would be a nation that would fit this category? What would be a way in which God would be judging them according to God's character throughout the Bible? It would be by diseases. It would be by sicknesses. And that's exactly right. It would be by, you know, the, uh, it would be specifically the nation of China. Now I'm going to get into that in just a moment, but I want you to look at Revelation chapter number 14, verse number 6. The purposes of God's judgment is to bring Him glory. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Notice that statement. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And there's many times throughout the Bible, and a couple of other times actually in the book of Revelation, where... God talks about people giving him glory. God talks about that he is deserving of glory. He sent his angel to proclaim a message. Hey, fear God and give him glory for his judgment. The hour of his judgment has come. And you know, one of the things that we can do is we can glorify God for his judgments. We can glorify God when, and this is the exact the epitome of that example when God is pouring out his judgments upon the heathen or pouring out his judgments upon wicked people. People. Now, as I said, and, you know, Brother Hall ruined you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the subject of the end of the sermon, which is very interesting. No, I'm just kidding. Is the, the country of China. The country of China is an ideal and perfect example of a nation, a heathen nation that is just continually being judged by God. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of the history of China. Now, China has, from its inception been a godless, pagan, idolatrous nation just filled with false religion and they're filled with a bunch of God-haters is what that nation is filled with. A lot of people don't know what China is like because they're so closed off from the public. And I'm going to talk about why here in just a minute. So we don't get a lot of information about what goes on in the, in the nation of China. But China is a very godless nation. It's an extremely godless nation. And it is a nation that has historically hated the Bible and has historically persecuted believers of the Lord Jesus Christ and believers of the God of the Bible. But also, China is a nation that, that has a history of epidemics of diseases and plagues and sicknesses. Now, virtually every plague that you can think of that spread throughout, you know, the... the uh, uh, you know, the medieval times, the Middle Ages, and even earlier than that, in the 11, 1200s, started in China. You may not be aware of that, but all three of the death plagues that, that sweep the nation that were pandemics and just epidemics all throughout that region of the country of Asia and spread to Europe, all three of them began in China. Now, I'm going to read a couple of, uh, of uh, quotations here for you. Plagues have killed tens of millions of people around the world in three major pandemics. In the 1300s, it was known as the Black Death. The bacterium is believed to have originated in Yunnan in the southwest China, where it remains, where it remains endemic. Plagues caused 
an epidemic in China in the 1330s and, and again in the 1350s, causing tens of millions of deaths. Tens of millions in the 1300s. The 1330s outbreak also spread west across Central Asia via traders using the Silk Road. And that's how that particular plague spread to Europe at that time. Now, we, we're of Western society. We're of Western civilization. We don't sit around and study Chinese culture. How much do you know personally about Chinese culture and the history of China? Almost none, right? But how much do you know about European culture? A lot more. When in, in, in history class, we're of Western civilization, which is that of you know, Greece, and, and there's kind of this streamline of those that settled in Europe, and then, of course, coming to America, Australia would also be considered, because they are European immigrants, Western society, and Western culture. So when we think of these plagues, who, where do you think of the death plague, or the black plague taking place? Europe. But it began in China, and China was affected by it way worse. Now, at the time of the Black Plague coming about in Europe, what was going on in Europe? Mass persecution of Christians for another 100, you know, 400, 500 years at the time that it came about. All of these diseases and pestilence, what was going on during the time of the Middle Ages? Mass persecution from the Roman Catholic Church and oppression upon real true Christians. Now, China has also been guilty of this all throughout its inception, like I said. Banning religion, having a monarchy where there was no religion allowed, and specifically they would target Christianity. And that was always their biggest target. It's always everyone's biggest target because it's the only true religion. Nobody cares about all these false religions. They, if, of course, it's the devil behind it, and he wants to do away with Christ. Now... Uh, also, the third plague pandemic, I want to read to you about this, was a major bubonic plague pandemic that began in Yunnan, China, again, in 1855. During the fifth year of Xian Feng, emperor of the Qing dynasty. Now, this was when it was still a monarchy. That lasted from 1855 to 1959. The bu a bubonic plague. So, so now, did anybody, was anybody aware of that? Tens of millions of people died throughout that period of time, 1855 to 1959. In 2019, people are getting, still getting the bubonic plague. In fact, 28 people in China's inner Mongolian province are now under quarantine because a hunter caught the plague after eating a wild rabbit. Authorities reported Sunday. This was November 21st, 2019. So people are still being affected by, that, by still that same plague today in the nation of China. A lot of people wonder why those in China, when you see pictures of people walking around in streets and walking around in urban areas of downtown cities, what do you always notice that's very, very odd about the people in China? All of them have on these face protective masks every time. They have on you know, the dust mask or the face protective respiratory mask, right? What have you heard was the reason why? Bad smog, or maybe you thought or heard that it's just because they're very health conscious, right? That's not why. It's because the, the nation of, of China, that land in particular, everywhere where they live, is just smitten and, and is permeated with disease and sickness and plagues constantly. Right. Over and over and over again. And they know... I mean, look at all of the different plagues. Study just the last 100 years. Study just the last 30 or 40 years and look at all the sicknesses and diseases that break out there. And that's with them taking the extra precaution of wearing the mask all the time. Which, that's a, that's a pretty big precaution. Constantly living your life when you're walking every day to and fro in the streets wearing a, a mask every day. I mean, that's major. You know, that should prevent a lot of diseases and things, doesn't it? I mean, you see people working in hospitals all the time and a lot of times... You know, the, the, the staff members do not contract or do not catch these different diseases. Why? Because they have the face protective mask on. China is smitten with such, you know, severe and sore diseases that everyone is sick, getting sick all the time anyways. And what is the reason why? Why would that be? Now, I'm going to go through some of the history of China that you're probably not aware of. And I, I looked this up quite a bit, and I learned a lot about it as well. Some of it I knew, some of it I did not know. As I said, you know, China has always been a pagan, heathen nation. You know, uh, uh, in, in most areas, you know, uh, 
you know, most people don't know, you know a lot of what I'm getting ready to go over right now, but China has been a godless, Christ-rejecting nation all throughout its in inception, the beginning of it. All throughout history, it has not only been a heathen nation, but it has been known for its persecution of Christianity and those that believe the Bible. They are very well known for that. And that's as back as far as you can go. Now, the famous example of this is the most brutal tyrant that has ever walked this earth. And his name is Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong, you can pronounce it. Sometimes it's pronounced in English. But Mao Zedong is how it's pronounced in Chinese, or, uh, in China. Mao Zedong was the, the infamous tyrant and he reigned in China. And I will refer to it as a reign in China during its uh, major revolutions. There was two major revolutions that took place in China. And this was throughout the early parts of the 21st century. So that's Mao Zedong. He was raised royally with parents who were farmers and eventually went to school and was educated. Many people were not educated, you know, that, that grew up, you know, more rurally and they grew up in a farm, right? So he ended up becoming educated and he went to universities and during his time at universities he learned the ideologies and the philosophies of a man named Karl Marx. This is actually where he learned this. He learned English and he read books and he read you know, uh, uh, a lot on Karl Marx. Now Karl Marx is the founder of modern day communism. Of course communism in different facets has existed in, in nations but modern day communism the founder of that is Karl Marx and he looked up to Karl Marx and he believed in communism. He believed in that system of government. Now Karl Marx of course was a, was a rabid atheist and a rabid evolutionist and his philosophies are based upon God-hating beliefs. Communism is a godless type of system and it is based upon evolution and atheism. That is where the philosophies of that type of, of social and, and cultural construct come from. Just to make sure that you understand that. Every nation you look at that's communist, do you know what all of them are? A bunch of God haters. Every single one of them. Every tyrant that came from a communist nation, it doesn't matter who it is, they're a bunch of God haters. They hate the Lord, they hate Christianity, you know, you can go through all of them and they're all the same way. All the nations are the same way. They're very atheistic nations, right? Well, Mao Zedong was one of the very first members that actually joined the Communist National Association, even when it was, wasn't very much heard of. He, at this time, joined Joseph Stalin. He was a part of it and he was one of his heroes and he met him personally and was friends with Joseph Stalin. Of course, he is the head of the Soviet Union who was also a mass murderer, God-hater. He is a communist. Mao Zedong eventually grew in influence and power in the nation of China. And this was during a war that was going on with China and Japan. Well, China being split like this needed to come together because there had been this division that was going on that Mao Zedong was, 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 was growing in, in, in kind of a, a rebellion, right? Uh, it was outside of the government. But then the government at this time is like, hey, we need to unify. So he contacted Mao Zedong and they came together and they defeated Japan. And this actually worked out for Mao Zedong to grow into power, to grow in power and to grow in authority. And what ended up happening, what happening was he became the head of China over time. Few you know, years, or I'm not exactly sure, the time period that went by, maybe 10 years, maybe less than that. But he ultimately became the president of the nation of China. Now in 1912, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but 1912, that's when China ceased from being a monarchy for, they were, they were a monarchy for centuries and centuries. Back like, like, China is a very old, very old nation. All the way back to like, uh, 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 you know, the 200s BC, they were a monarchy all the way up. So literally, I mean, you know, just a long time, over a thousand years, they were a monarchy. And they became uh, a communist country in 1912. Now this was right around the time, and even before this, Mao Zedong was a communist himself. And these, obviously, these things were being taught in universities. That's where he was, uh, you know, learning them. So they were moving away from the system of a monarchy where there was a king. So he became the president of China eventually, and this is when things began to change drastically. In 1956, and this is a major in history, is when he started what's known as the Cultural Revolution. The Cultural Revolution. And basically what it was, was he wanted to be, he wanted to get rid of Western influences and anything that had to do with Western society. 
He wanted to completely get rid of any, any influence of Western society. Now this had to do, of course, with capitalism and things like that. But let me tell you this. If you study what took place, do you know what he wanted to get rid of? And what, exactly. Christianity. Do you know where all of the ideologies of Western society are founded upon and predicated upon? Christianity. Our Christian beliefs. They're based upon the Bible. So what Mao Zedong really wanted to do was he wanted to get rid of Christianity. So what do you think was banned at this time? Christianity. And what do you think started to happen? They started to persecute Christians. Now, if, I want you to remember, this was, they were already persecuting it before that. They were already persecuting Christianity and Christians before that. But it ramped up big time when Mao Zedong started the... He, he proclaimed, he made a proclamation and sent out all of the information... That the cultural revolution has began, you know, we're, we are out with Western society, and he made a declaration and a decree that Christianity was banned. And he began in mass you know, amounts persecuting and harming and, and, and hurting Christians, Christians during this time. So the state started to control everything. Now, under Mao's rule, between 40 to 65 million people were murdered. 40 to 65 million people. He was displacing people, moving them from cities out to rural areas. He was torturing people. He was, he was forcing people with a gun to their head to bury their children alive. To stand there and bury their own children alive. Can you imagine that? They were just taking children and like tossing them into rivers like babies. Like these were some of the recorded types of ways that they would harm, hurt, and torture. And who do you think they targeted the most? Christians. Tens of millions of Christians died during this time. People that were still practicing Christianity. He wanted to get rid of Western society. And, and what, is the, what, you know, what is the structure and the skeleton of Western society, of all of our beliefs? Christianity. That's what he was targeting and that's what he hated so much. Mao Zedong was an atheist. He was an evolutionist. He hated God. And that's what he wanted to do. Was he wanted to rid his nation of Christianity. The Cultural Revolution, yes, of course, of course he hated Western society, but he hated it because he hated Christianity. It is branded by Christianity. That is what you think of when you think of Western society. What formed and fashioned every, every area and every you know, uh, uh, contour of Western society? Christianity. So what do you think he did? He banned Bibles. He's famously known for making the statement that the Bible is a book of cults and Christianity is the biggest cult. These are things that Mao Zedong did. He, 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 he grew in personality and he's one of the most famous examples of a personality cult that has ever taken place. People worshipped him. They made idols of him. They carried these idols around. And that's what he wanted was just as Satan wants. He wants to displace God and put himself in place of the Lord. So he was making idols of himself. People are worshiping him. There are literal examples of people bowing down to Mao Zedong. And he was persecuting Christians. And people will try to argue that the Bibles weren't banned. Bibles were banned. I've looked at it from many different... Bibles were banned. Christianity was banned during the Cultural Revolution. Not only that, but during this time period, of course, he, he, he announced atheism as the official religion. And all other, you know, not official religion, but official beliefs. It is officially considered an atheistic state. He's famous for a couple of other quotes. He said, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. He also said, too, uh, to read too many books is harmful. Do you hear what I just said? To read too many books is harmful. Why do you think somebody would make a statement like that. Of course a tyrant doesn't want you to learn and grow in knowledge. He doesn't want you to read the Bible. He doesn't want you to grow in wisdom. This is how, this is how wicked leaders and corrupt leaders operate. They want you to stay ignorant. There are real people out there, even in the United States of America, that are, that are trying to oppress Christianity. They're trying to oppress the people of the United States of America. They're slowly deteriorating our culture even. And what they want you to do is they want you to be stupid. Because stupid people are easy to control. Intelligent people are harder to control. Intelligent people can see where things are heading when you know, a, a, a country is growing towards a system of communism and fascism and tyrants. And that's why he made the statement, to, to read too many books is harmful. It wasn't harmful for him. 
You know, he wants to be educated. I'm sure he wants his children to be educated. So in that sense, it's not harmful. No, it's harmful to him. That's why. When everybody learns and everybody's knowledgeable, it's harmful to him. That's what he means. Right. He's trying to deter people from reading because if you're intelligent, well, then you can revolt. If you're intelligent, then you won't just go along with all of the wickedness that he is uh, perpetrating. He also said this. This is a famous quote, and this actually comes from Mao Zedong. The end justifies the means. That is a famous quote that I've heard in the United States. How many times? Hundreds of times in my life. Have you heard it as well? That is a famous quote from Mao Zedong. And do you know what they were taken from? Has anyone heard of the Little Red Book? When, when the Cultural Revolution started, Mao Zedong had a, had a small little book. It almost looks like a, a vesture Bible, a vestment Bible, or a pocket Bible. And in this book... He had, there's just hundreds of Mao Zedong quotes. It's like Proverbs of Mao Zedong. These were issued to every single Chinese citizen, and it was compulsory reading. And they checked to make sure that you knew the book and that you were reading it. And it's called the Little Red Book. Now, of course, red is the Red Party is the Communist Party. That's why I refer to it as the Red Book. Their flag has the communist symbols on it. Like they are openly communist as can possibly be. And you refer to it as the Little Red Book, and it's, it's just Quotes just from Mao Zedong only. I mean, he's the example of this sociopath. He's the perfect ideal example of a sociopath, of, 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 of a tyrant. And what do they always want? They want themselves to be worshipped. So they're trying to do away with Christianity. They're trying to do away with the Lord and with Christ. <clears throat> so, you know, he was a super just wicked, evil, evil man. And he ended up dying in, I believe, the 70s. I'm positive. It was the 70s. I don't remember exactly when. But he died in the 1970s around some time. And things cooled down a little bit. It was still a communist country, and people were still persecuted, and specifically Christians were still persecuted. But if you study China, and you, and you look at headlines and news you know, articles and things like that, it's very obvious over the past five years or so, that there's been a big ramp up. It's been vamped up as far as the persecution of Christianity. Now a lot of people think and, and, and will say all these idiots that are in support of communism or socialism or you know, whatever you want to call it, it's all basically the same thing. But a lot of these, these people that are ignorant will say like, oh, there's religious freedom in China. Because their constitution says that you have religious freedom, right? You know, you know all the different, just, just as a side point, do you realize all of the different nations that had things written in their constitution, but they're not practiced? You know, there is freedom, uh, you know, to own a firearm in the United States today, but it's not complete freedom. Not at all. Our rights have, it's that, you know, that they're not supposed to be infringed. That means, like, the fringe is the border of something. That means you're not supposed to even mess with them at all. Not even, the, you know, to the, to, the, to the outskirts of it. You can't touch it at all. And our rights, as far as the Second Amendment, is a perfect example where our rights have been infringed. Where there's states that have literally banned, like any, you know, the capacity is like, I, I can't even remember exactly what it is, but it's anything above like 15 or 16 now, do you know what I'm talking about? I can't remember what it is. You know, but uh, a lot of nations have things written in their constitution, but they don't practice them. So this, these are the requirements, and, and this is how religious freedom supposedly works in China. I want you to listen to this. <clears throat> All churches in China must be registered with the nation. They must be registered with the nation. You have to be a registered church. In order to exist, you must be registered. There are only five religions that are, that are sanctioned or allowed, if you will, in the state or the nation of China. Uh, Buddhism, Taoism, uh, Roman, uh, uh, not Roman Catholicism, it's Chinese Catholicism, and they're not, they're not connected with the Roman Catholic Church at all. Um, and then, what are the other ones? Uh, uh, Islam, and then there are certain branches of Protestantism. And Baptists do not exist, by the way, in China. They're not allowed to exist. They stamp them out immediately. They're immediately you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, destroyed and extinct. Um, so those are the types of churches and types of Protestants. Super heavy Catholic style. Presbyterians, I looked them up. Those are the ones that exist. The overly Catholic, they're basically Catholics. All of their members must be registered. If you are not a registered member of the church, registered, not just within the church, the, you have to be registered with the government in order to go to that church. 
or you cannot attend the churches. So every church must be registered in order to exist. And if you, and if you do not register, the church will be shut down and they literally will pulverize the building and destroy the building. Or they'll just basically take everything and kick everybody out if you're like, you know, in uh, uh, some high rise. I've seen them do that. I watched a bunch of videos and was looking up a lot of this stuff. So you must be registered as a church in order to exist. You must be one of the five sanctioned churches. Every member at your church must be registered or you will be arrested. You ha they have to know who all the members are. The government provides the translation of whatever the holy book is. Do you hear what I just said? The government has to translate the book. So the Bible, when, they, when these churches come like Presbyterians and they're reading from the Bible, it's not a book that just some Chinese Christian translated from Greek or maybe even English or whatever it is. Because people will do that sometimes, use the King James Bible and then translate it. No, the government translates it. And then they issue to you. And they make sure that you're using the issued version of the government translated holy book. Whatever the holy book is, that's why I'm saying that. Even the Quran, the government translates it and then gives it to them. The, those that are Islam. I wonder why. Because they're making sure they omit things. They're making sure they, they interpret it how they want it to be interpreted. Yeah, I'm sure, I wonder what the, the verse in the New Testament says where, where uh, the, uh, the apostles proclaim it is better to obey God rather than men. I wonder what that verse says in the, in the Chinese translation. Um, not only that, this is bizarre. These two points. All churches must, must have a CCTV system installed. And this CCTV system is not the church's. It is installed and the church has to pay for it. But then they have to set it up and give access only to, the authorization is given to the, to the Chinese government. So the, there's all of these, these, these a CCTV is closed caption television. So there's tons of cameras everywhere. All throughout the church, the outside, the inside, and they watch everything that you say. And everything that goes on and everything. And they surveil, they have surveillance constantly, they monitor these systems. Not only that, if the church gets bigger than 75 you know, to 100 people, they have two officers, uh, you know, uh, uh, authorities of the government, official officers from the government that are at every service. At least two officers, depending upon the size. That stand there and they literally monitor the services going on. You wonder why there's all these underground churches, but then you also hear people say, hey, they have freedom of religion. It's because they don't really have freedom of religion in China. It's because anything that can be even slightly a threat to the, you know, to, you know, uh, the Chinese government, they try to stomp it out. That's why. And the Bible is very clearly a book that exalts God and not man. So, of course, you have all of these leaders in this communist type of system where they want to be God. What religion do you think that they're going to hate the most and try to ban? Of course, the Bible. You have so many examples of people just like the communist China, you know, uh, officials throughout the Bible and God destroying them, mocking them, presenting them in a bad light. Basically, Mao Zedong is Nebuchadnezzar. That's pretty much what goes on. And Nebuchadnezzar exalts himself. He wants everyone to worship him. And what's he do? He bans all religions other than the religions that bring glory to him. Right. That's what he does. And that's what Mao Zedong... People try in China to say, hey, you know, we're different now. Mao Zedong is gone. Some people will try to say that. That's people outside of China. China does not feel that way, fool. They still have Mao Zedong's face on their stinking currency to this day. But you expect me to believe that they denounce Mao Zedong. You're an idiot. You know, you, all, that's why public and uh, 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 media and stuff is just cut off from China. You're not allowed to see anything because this is the type of wickedness that goes on. In, from 2019 to 2020, there has been over a hundred pastors that have been arrested. And half of them, they don't even know where they went. They have no idea. Yeah, I'm sure they're probably in the bottom of an, uh, some ocean somewhere, or dead and buried, or have been cremated already. They have no idea. Their wives don't know where they are. A lot of the, the wives, and when that happened, they moved to the United States. And came to the United States and joined a Chinese church here. And they've given their story and said, you know, my, my husband was a pastor of an underground church. 
and he just disappeared one day. China, you know, the Chinese officials came in, they ransacked the place, they took all of our equipment, all of our cameras, they just destroyed everything, kicked everybody out, arrested tons of people, and then my and they took my husband and I haven't seen him since, and nobody knows, and I reach out to them and they won't give me any answers. You know, Sometimes we, with our freedom that we have in the United States of America, we don't understand what it's like when you have an oppressive government. And you have no choices and nothing that you can do. Where they just come in, kick the door down, they have all the firepower, they have all of the authority, and they can do whatever they want and push you around. And it doesn't matter how much you scream and yell about oppression, they don't care. You call them up and say, hey, where's my husband? And they'll hang up on you. Or they'll threaten you and tell you to keep your mouth shut or they'll come arrest you too. Now, this goes on in nations and countries. China is probably, you know, it's, it's for sure one of the most godless heathen nations, and I would say it's probably the most godless heathen nation that exists on the earth to this day. Constantly, even still, they're persecuting Christians. Any sort of fundamentalist, you know what they do to some of the pastors that they know where they're at? They arrest the pastors, and then they, they're in prison in like these horrible conditions. They torture some of them. And then they also, one thing they do commonly is they put them in these rehabilitation centers where they literally sit there and try to brainwash them and indoctrinate them with the ideology of the government. Worship the government. Believe in the government. You know, any sort of fundamentalism that you believe, they'll try to get you out of that. Believe in, they, and one of the things they try to do is get you to believe in evolution. They teach evolution big time. That's what some of the pastors said. They try to cram that down your throat because evolution and Christianity are... Polar opposites of one another. You can't believe both. And people are idiots that try to say they're Christian evolutionists. No, you know, the, Chinese, the Chinese government understands. They try to get people to believe in evolution, to reject Christianity, to not be a fundamentalist. Just, yeah, you can, you can preach the Bible, but you know, this is the things that you're allowed to preach. And any, type, any you know, crosswords, any bad you know, uh, criticism that you, that you put forward about the government, they come in, they shut you down, and they throw you in a cage. Or they kill you. Yeah, so this goes on in nations all the time. Now, why, why do you think that, these, that China is just like this, this nation that's just constantly being just stricken with plagues? Between uh, 19, I thought I had it down here, 1959 and 1967, during Mao Zedong's rule, tens of millions of people died. Do you know why? It was a huge famine. Between... 1959 and 1967, tens of millions of people died because of a famine, because of pestilence. Now, do you know what? You know how long the bubonic plague went on? Do you remember? I read it, 1855 to 1959. So they went through that plague for 100 years. Again, it says tens of millions of people in China died during that period of time. But then, just between 1959 and 1967, immediately after that, a, 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 a famine plague began. And tens of millions of people died in just eight, nine years because of this terrible famine that went on in China during, those, during that time. There's a recent outbreak. And I don't know if you know how big this is. It's all over the news, of course, but of a virus that's going around called the coronavirus. The coronavirus. This is not a coincidence. This is not just, you know, that this nation just has all these problems, just the area of the world that they live in. It's not a coincidence at all. That all of a sudden, this new president that comes in, he vamps up all of the persecution on Christians, tightens up all of the different rules and regulations, and kicks more people out of what they do already allow of Christianity. Killing Christians, beating Christians. There's been public videos that have been posted to YouTube where they just come in and just beat the living crap out of Christians in their churches, shut the church down, and people were able to like hide a phone and somehow get that uploaded and then it spread. There, you know, there is, a, again, a, it, they rose in their persecution of Christians like according to the, uh, some sort of national, uh, not even a Christian organization, like a world uh, uh, organization. I can't remember what it is. 27% in the past year. 27% in the past year they've risen as far as being where they are on the charts of the nations that persecute Christianity. And then all of a sudden in the past year, they've just been, had all these other plagues. We see the bubonic plague arise again. And now we see 
an, an epidemic, a pandemic called the coronavirus. There have been, of, of the outbreak, there have been 2,126 people confirmed dead just in the past two weeks of the coronavirus. Now, it just started. The CDC said that, that it is regularly tripling in numbers, the amount of people. There has only been 17 deaths outside of China. Where do you think it began? China. Same place where all the, the black plague, the death plague, where all the plagues began. China. In Yunnan, China, which is oftentimes where the other ones begin too. 66,288 people are currently, have been currently confirmed infected with the coronavirus in the state of China. This has only been going on for a few weeks, the coronavirus. It just began recently. And as I said, the CDC says that these numbers are tripling like on a regular basis. They have a count of the deaths. They have a count. People are now from China are obviously bringing it to other areas. There's been some people in New York that have caught this. And what is it? It's a disease. It's a sickness. It's a plague. Do you know what it is? And I and you know I'm guilty of this as well, where I I I I just think, oh, it's just some sort of disease or disorder. You look around at the nations today, and when things break out, you know, you, you the first thing you think of is not that it's the judgment of God. You actually put that in the back of your mind. I am a hundred percent positive after studying that nation, after studying this this subject and studying the Bible, I'm just as sure that the coronavirus is a judgment of God that I am that AIDS was a judgment in the United States. Amen. Now, I am just as sure of the both. Coronavirus is a judgment from the Lord. It's a sickness and a disease that God has smitten that nation with, just like He did so many other times to that nation, because of their persecution and their mistreatment to Christians. And if they continue to persecute Christianity, all of these true believers, these born-again believers, they're having to hide out, they're having to hide and read their Bibles, they're having to fear every day whether or not they're going to lose their life. All of these leaders and all of these people, they're going to be like Herod. They're going to be like all these other nations, the nations of the Philistines. And these nations where God judges them. You know what he does? He judges them with a sickness and with a disease and with a pestilence. And he smites them with the botch and with the itch and with the scab. So when all of these godless heathens die, they die scratching and itching. They die in misery. They die in depression. They die in just affliction. And, and just it, the, the worst, most unpleasant conditions that you could possibly die in. God doesn't just take their life most of the time. God puts them just in uh, uh, just complete misery is what he does. It's the perfect word for that, where their life just ends in a horrendous way. I can tell you from the arm of the Lord. Amen. His arm is stretched out against them because of their persecution against Christians. And all of these, these, these stinking fools, like Mao Zedong, these, just these godless antichrists who try to raise themselves up and be God, their time only lasts for a little while. It's very short. The, the time that they have on this earth, but you know what it is? I mean, you look at the life of Mao Zedong and you think, man, he lived a... Uh, you know, it seemed like God didn't really strike him that much. His entire life, there was a plague going on his whole life. His whole life. And then... During the end of his life, like the last 10 years basically of his life, there was a famine that could kill tens of millions of people. But not only that, when he died, just like the rich man, he lift up his eyes being in torments. Amen. And he's going to be tormented the rest of, for all eternity. There is no rest. For all eternity. Just, just an eternal existence of just torment and punishment. And here's the thing. You know, we, you know as Christians we hear, and this is a major flaw in a lot of Baptist churches today where, where it's always pray for everybody. We want, you know, we want everybody to be saved. Praise the Lord. Well, we do want everybody to be saved. But there are people in general we want everybody to be saved. But those people sometimes that God wants to be saved and that we would have wished that they would have been saved, they move so far away from the Lord where they become the enemies of God. Where they become, what the Bible refers to as they hate God. What we would call God-haters. Just kind of transposing those two. Where they hate the Lord. And the Bible says that God gives them over. God no longer wants them to be saved. The Bible talks about people that God blinds their eyes. And many times in the Bible, God will speak about His judgments upon nations. Where He is just 
putting people in agony and misery and pain and affliction and vexation where people are screaming out just the worst conditions imaginable. And, but God will talk about how that brings Him glory and how that brings Him praise. Amen. We should praise God for the judgments of the Lord. Amen. We should praise God. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed of God's, of God's judgment and God's wrath. I'm not embarrassed... That, that, that people would look at the judgments of the Lord and say, man, that's, you know, that seems a little bit cruel. Sometimes that's what people deserve. Right. And some of these wicked, godless nations they have no idea why they have to walk around every day with a mask on. Nobody else has to do that. But it just so happens to be the nation that persecute, persecutes Christianity in extreme measures not even close to any other nation. And they have a long history of it. So I am not, I am not even questioning about the coronavirus. And, and to be honest, I was in the beginning. I kept thinking about it because I heard people saying it. The coronavirus is the judgment of God. The coronavirus is the judgment of God. And I thought to myself, well, you seem pretty quick to say that. A lot of people seem pretty quick to say that. But oftentimes what it is is we might be a little bit slow to say that. Right. To see God's hand stretched out and God punishing people and things happening in people's lives. Like, well, I don't want to say too quickly, you know that they're being judged by God, oftentimes we're erring on that side. But when you, when you look at the nation of China and you look at the things going on and you see their mass persecution of Christianity, I had heard about some of it, but I had no idea until I looked it all up. They have probably persecuted Christians more than anyone else in the history because it went on, in history at all, because it went on for such long periods of time. They are the most godless, heathen, pagan nation that exists.